Welcome to the first example problem from chapter 7, where we deal with work, energy, and power. So in this example, we are going to see for the first time in full in one of these videos, the process that we're going to be using for all of our chapter 7 problems. We've seen this happen each separate chapter where we have this general problem solving technique, draw a picture, figure out what we have, figure out what we want but we've seen it applied in slightly different ways in each chapter. The same thing goes here in chapter seven. We do wanna start with a picture as always before we even read the question. So we have a 200 gram ball dropped from the top of a building. So we can draw that building and the ball. And we are told that it's dropped, which means the initial speed is zero meters per second. The other thing that we have done in previous chapters and will continue to do here is to make a list of the information that is given to us. So the mass here is 200 grams, but we need to have seen this often enough that we know that this is supposed to be in kilograms. There's a thousand grams in one kilogram. And so this is 0 0.2 kilograms. The 50 meter tall building we have used that as Y or Y initial in the past, but we are going to be calling it H for height here in chapter seven, and we will see that and become more comfortable with it as we continue on in this uh, chapter. Air resistance acts on it as it falls and it hits the ground at 20 meters per second. So here at the ground, the final velocity is 20 meters per second. All right, so the first thing we're asked to do is to find the work done by air resistance. Now, here's where we practice a new technique um, that we will be using all throughout this chapter, where in our picture, beyond just the list of given information, we want to describe what we mean by the start of the problem. So here's our before, and we want to label that as before. And then our after, when it is hitting the ground, that is our after situation. And the reason why that's important and useful is because in this chapter, beyond this um, picture and list of given information, the thing that is really, really going to help us keep track of everything and stay organized is a little table of the different energy areas that we could have in the before situation and in the after situation. So we're going to get used to making this little table. It really will help us not only keep track of things, but also understand how each problem is slightly different um, and has similarities each time. So the first thing we're going to be looking for is kinetic energy. This is us asking the question, are we moving? And it will be a yes or no. And if we answer yes, we'll put in the term. And if we answer no, then we'll put in a zero. So let's do that now. At the beginning of the problem, in the before, are we moving? And the answer is no. We dropped it from rest. So a no means we get a zero in that spot. In the after part of the situation, we ask ourselves, are we moving? A simple yes or no question based on the picture that we've drawn, and the answer is yes. In that case, we make the term show up for kinetic energy, one half mv squared. I've labeled it v final here because that's what we labeled it, but you could just call it v. All right, the other type of energy that we have at the beginning of the chapter is the potential energy from gravity. This is asking ourselves, are we higher? And more specifically, we're asking ourselves, are we higher at this point in the problem than at other points in the problem? So if we look at the beginning and we look at our picture, we are higher here at the beginning of the problem. So in the before situation, we would write MGH. When we ask ourselves that same yes or no question, are we higher at the end of the problem, we're here at the bottom of the building, the answer would be no. Then beneath 
our before and after situation, we want to ask ourselves, is there work? Is there a work term? When we ask this question, we do not want to put it in the before column. We do not want to put it in the after column. This is a separate question. When we're trying to figure out if there is or isn't, the things we are looking for are a push force or a pull force or friction or air resistance. And so the answer is yes here from air resistance. We're told about it in the problem and part A, we're looking for that value. All right. So all of this setup is on our page before we actually go through and do any problem solving. It seems like a lot, but it's laying out everything that we need for the problem so that all we have to do for parts A and B is just plug things into equations that we have. All right, so our big equation for this chapter with our energy balance problems is that the energy before plus the work added is equal to the energy after. Now the book has slightly different labeling and we comment on that in the slides, but this really is the always correct and useful in all circumstances way of describing this. We figure out what energy did we start with, how has that energy changed, and what energy do we end with. It is very much like a budget for a particular month. You may have money coming in or out, but we are comparing what we started with to what we ended with. All right, so in part A, we are trying to find what that work term is. So we use this equation and we use this setup that we've done for ourselves. When we look at the energy before column, the energy before is zero plus MGH. We're just adding up all of those terms that show up in that column. When we look at the work term, we are saying, did we actually have a work term? And the answer is yes. So we'll write the word work. And then when we look at energy after, we are adding up everything in this after column. And so we have one half MV squared plus zero. Now, what I want us to understand is it's not necessary to get the correct answer, but to put in these zeros, but it is a really, really good practice to have a single step where you have a placeholder for all of the yes or no questions to remind yourself that you asked those questions, because every example we see will have a different set of yeses and nos that we're responding with but it will always look like this with just different terms that show up on the left or the right. Now we can plug in numbers. Now I'm going to scroll down so that I give ourselves a little more breathing room on this. All right. So we have a lot already given to us and this list of um, terms here is really useful for us to look at. Mass was 0.2 kilograms. G is 9.8. It's been that way for the last many chapters. And the height is 50 meters. Okay. When we have the work term, we know that's what we're solving for, so we just leave it as our single unknown. This is what we are looking for and solving for in this problem. And then on the right side, we have one half times the 0 0.2 times the 20, that's the final velocity, squared, plus 0. And so we can simplify this a bit. The before terms, there's only one term total, and that's 98 joules. We've been introduced to this new um, unit, and we do want to get used to it, plus our unknown work is equal to, and on the right side, we have 40 joules. 
All right, so all we have to do to solve for work is subtract 98 joules from both sides. And we get that our work here, our work done by air resistance or work added by air resistance is negative 58 joules. Now we always want to do that step six check to make sure that makes sense to us. The air resistance was slowing us down. It was taking energy away from us. So we do expect that negative to exist. The work added term can be positive or negative, and we always just want to have it in the initial problem as plus work added. And maybe it's negative work, maybe it's not, but we don't want to put in a plus or minus sign too early. It's what comes out naturally at the end. All right, for part B, and I'm going to scroll down a little bit more to give myself some more space. Part B is asking us if the air resistance was constant, so if we're just kind of assuming an average air resistance force, what would the force from the air resistance be? So for this situation, we need to go back to the definition of work, which is the force in the direction of motion times the distance that we travel, the distance over which that force is acting. It is worth noting we have seen this written as F times D times the cosine of theta, but the important thing for us to recognize is that we, if we use this term, we have to make sure we recognize what the textbook is expecting theta to look like, what angle it's really asking for. And so this is not a good starting point if we're trying to build critical thinking understanding of what this actually means for us. So in this case, we have negative 58 joules is equal to the force that we're looking for times the distance that we traveled. The distance that we traveled is this height up here, the 50 meters. That is the difference in location from the before situation to the after situation. So when we divide both sides by 50, we get that the force is negative. So it's 1.16 newtons against the motion. That's what the negative sign means. It's in the opposite direction. That negative sign would come from an angle of 180 degrees. So in this case, 180 degrees is what you can use if you really are convinced you have to use this instead of the suggested method of actually thinking about what we're plugging in. The 180 degrees is how this would get used. The reason why this one on the right here from the textbook is not as useful to us is because it comes from a dot product in calculus. And if we've never learned about dot products from calculus, then we don't have a full understanding of why that cosine term appears. This here written out in words is a robust description of what it is we're trying to do, how much of the force is in the direction of motion and all of it is exactly opposite the motion. That works out fine. That's what the negative sign means. Here we have to make sure that we're understanding what that angle means and it can really throw us off if we don't understand and are just trying to plug numbers into equations. All right, so we have finished this very first um, example. It's longer than usual because I'm describing in more detail each of the steps. Hopefully we will see these steps applied over and over and get more comfortable with what it is we're doing and how chapter seven problems are similar to each other. I will see you in those next videos.